All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Men That Can Project podcast. I'm Lockie Stewart and I am your host today. And today we're joined with Matt Zerka, who's joining us from Toronto. Uh, I think it's late there. I didn't actually ask what time it is there, but I'm assuming it's going to be late. Uh, yeah, it's 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 11 p.m., but uh, it's uh, it's a good time. It's as good a time as ever. I, I, I'm definitely going to be hitting the sack like right after. I'll roll off the podcast into bed. <laughs> Mate, if I were you, I would have been taking this podcast from bed. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, but it's video. So like, you know, doing this in bed, it would have been a bit weird for your viewers. Yeah, looking up under the chin. It would have been. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. My, my COVID-30 would have been showing hard. <laughs> well i appreciate you uh considering showering before you jumped on mate and uh no i'm kidding i should have warned you yeah with, it's yeah. it's one roll it's one roll of the neck for every lockdown i've been in <laughs> it's perfect that's but, like four yeah <laughs> i can't how many you've done but you're uh the founder and ceo of tether uh which is a peer enabled mental health and self-improvement platform for men i've had a had a look around everything and uh, been listening to a heap of your stuff, checking out a heap of your content, and I love what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I guess for for the audience and everything, like take us back. Like, what what is Tether? Obviously, I gave it a quick brief overview, but yeah. how does it all work? And how how did it come to mind? And why'd you start it? Because I know before that you were in corporate, right? Yeah, I, I was in. I was a, a financial professional uh, for my uh, entire career. Uh, before that, um, I'll I'll. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll start with my story and then, and then we can kind of hop into to tether and, and why that kind of came to be and then, and what it is as well. Um, but you know, I grew up here in, in Toronto, Canada. Um, and for those of us from Toronto, we don't, we don't say the T at the end. So you just got to roll with the N to the O it's just Toronto. Uh, we don't, we don't, yeah, it's Toronto. We don't call Toronto, right? So you got to drop, if you want to be from Toronto, you gotta, you gotta drop that T on the end. Um, so I grew up here in Toronto, Canada, uh, and, uh, you know, grew up in a, in a, in a good family, uh, in, in a lot of ways, never, never wanted for anything in my entire life. Uh, but when I grew up, uh, there was a couple of things that I think really, um, shaped who I was and, and how I felt about myself and how I interacted with the world. Um, and the biggest one was, um, you know, from the, from a very, very young age till, you know, almost high school, uh, I didn't really have any close friends in my life. And I was bullied severely when I was a kid. Um, it, made it, it made me always feel like I was kind of an other, like uh, I had to do more to fit in. I had to be funnier. I had to be uh, more, uh, I, I had to appease people. Uh, I had to perform in some way. Uh, and my parents loved me dearly, but um, I think a lot of, you know, people of our generation grew up, you know, especially with parents who, you know, grew up with parents that were, you know, in the war or before that and stuff like that. And, and, and emotional support and, you know, being really, you know, emotionally available was just never something that they were taught. And so uh, in a lot of ways, it was something that they could never give. And so the way that my parents, you know, helped us as children was, you know, through providing, through sending us to good schools, uh, through making sure that we got good grades, through working hard. My parents were very hardworking individuals, uh, you know, lawyer and accountant by trade. So come from a professional background. Um, but I, I, it was hard for me to emotionally connect with them. And, and a lot of the times what I felt was that when, uh, when I tried to say, you know, I'm struggling, I'm not doing well, um, it was either like, you know, you know, can't really talk about this right now, or there was like some frustration or anger that they didn't know how to deal with it. And so I internalized that uh, as that my feelings weren't wanted in some way, shape or form. Um, and so as a result, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time alone. Um, and, and, and it wasn't fun time alone. I, I dissociated a lot as a kid. I spent a lot of time in my head. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, in just sort of fantasy worlds uh, in my head, imagining things, wanting my life to be different in some ways, especially just wanting on a fundamental to feel like I was worthy uh, that I had connection and that I had people in my life, but I, I never really felt that in any kind of meaningful way. And so uh, I grew up, grades were very important in, in my home. So I grew up learning how to perform and getting a lot of validation from my performance. And that did me well in life. And, and it also uh, had a, a really, you know, it, it, it embedded with in me a, a very weird relationship with work. I can totally get into that as well. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the way that that manifested was, uh, you know, uh, an eating disorder when I was a teen, uh, that was undiagnosed, but definitely had uh, an eating disorder, a lot of partying, a lot of drinking, uh, in, in high school and university, again, as, as a way just to, to fit in, to be a part of, to seek connection with other people. Um, and then when I got to university, it all became about performance and, and, you know, I wanted to be at the top of my class. I wanted to to get this, this really, really great job. I, I wanted to succeed my way out of feeling the way that I felt about myself. Um, and so it, it worked for a while. Like I graduated top of my class in university. Uh, I did my CFA while I was an undergrad and into my professional career. And uh, when I started my professional career, uh, I got into uh, uh, the quantitative asset management space. Uh, became a portfolio manager by the time I was 27. Uh, we grew an asset management company, me and the, and the founders of this company from like zero dollars in assets to $350 million under management uh, in about four years. I, I was personally responsible for a, a decent chunk of all of that um, and spent a lot of time interacting with others. I, I, I learned you know, how to sell, which was a, you know, a hugely important skill set. Uh, I learned how to talk to people. I learned how to be passionate and communicative. And so there was a lot of benefit from that, but I, I still felt very empty in a lot of ways. I would come home, I would numb out. Um, I didn't feel really connected. I was always really searching for connection and big experiences. And I wanted, I wanted something more in life. And, and then what I would say was the turning point for me was uh, in 2018, one of my best friends died very suddenly uh, of a pulmonary embolism. And um, it was, it was, it was shocking, obviously, because it, it happened one day, it was, you know, it was just a, a random Sunday that it happened on. Uh, and we also we lived across uh, the, the this way from each other, I can't even describe it like a little alleyway, but uh, our balconies actually faced each other. And so oftentimes, we would just come onto our balconies and chat with each other on our balconies. And, and we would ride the, you know, ride the, the subway down to, to work together. We both worked downtown and there was a commuter train nearby. And we'd ride that together. Sometimes we'd ride back from work, but we actually met because we were both out on the balcony having a beer one day. Um, and we just started chatting with each other. And that was kind of the beginning of this friendship. Um, and, and so when he passed away, there was like this really, you know, deep void that was kind of left in me. And uh, I went into a, a very deep depression. I, I suffered from a lot of anxiety, uh, had, a, had trouble getting out of bed in the morning, went on mental health leave from work and, and proceeded to start to do absolutely everything in my power uh, to, to work my way back, you know, therapy, medication, uh, experimental treatments, uh, anything that I could do to, to heal, to, to help myself. And nothing was really working. Uh, and then in, uh, I was fortunate because I, I had a friend of mine who was actually training to become a therapist at the time, he said, you know, uh, I'm going to go join this men's group. And, and you know, I, 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 you know, I think it might help you. So do you want to come with me? And I said, sure. And, and I went to this men's group. And it was the first time that I was able, able to really communicate the, the idea that it's like, I didn't want to live anymore, but I didn't want to die. And I was stuck in this horrible limbo of life feeling just completely overwhelming, uh, not really understanding why I was feeling this way or what I could do about it. Um, and it was the first time that I was like, I was really in a group of, you know, like of my peers of just like regular guys that had been through something like that, who understood how I was feeling and, and, and knew in some way how to hold space for that. And knew how to make me feel loved, even at this point of feeling completely broken um, and, and, and inherently unlovable. And that was kind of this first little moment for me where something shifted. Uh, and I continued to go back to that, that group, uh, you know, week after week or every two weeks. And uh, eventually I ended up going to a men's retreat because I wanted to really go deeper into this work. I wanted to, you know, drop more into my own experience. I wanted to feel more of this. I wanted to heal from all of this. And uh, I went on that men's retreat and I, I had a really profound experience. And I, I came back on um, I came back on a Monday, and I ended up quitting my corporate finance job on, on the Wednesday, uh, with no no plan of what I was going to do. I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Quit my job. Uh, ended up in Asia for six weeks because I you know I just uh, I had to get the fuck out of there. 
Uh, sorry, I hope. Swe- I, by the way, I hope swearing is okay on on the podcast. That's great, man. Okay, good. Uh, I just kind of fall into it, and I never asked before. So yeah, I just I had to get the fuck out of there. Uh, decided that I was done, and uh, when I was traveling, I I I, I continued to you know, struggle and, and try and meet people. And I was having a great time. I met some incredible people, actually, uh, two people actually, you know, potentially doing some traveling with in the next little while as well. Um, but I came back and I just, I felt lost and I didn't really know what my purpose was. And I wanted to do something around mental health. I think that was really because I still felt like I had so much work to do in terms of my own healing. And I was actually having coffee with a friend of mine one day and he said this like kind of innocuous comment and for whatever reason it just set the dominoes in action in 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 my brain and I had this moment where I was like oh my god that's it it's like replicating what what I felt in that room of unconditional support love brotherhood connection um not feeling alone I was like this has to be something that people have tried to do for men and it turned out that, that they had, uh, there, there were other peer support platforms, there were group platforms, there were all of these things, but none of them were really catering to men specifically and speaking to building emotionally connected and vulnerable relationships between men. Um, and that was really what had been the most healing thing for me was actually being able to build these deep, emotionally connected, vulnerable relationships with other men uh, and being able to experience love from another man in, in a way that was pure and, uh, and, 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 you know, connected and, and brotherly. It, it was just never something I didn't have a brother growing up. I had a sister. And, and so I never had that brotherly connection. I, I, I felt I had really close guy friends, but this was super different because of the level of openness and vulnerability and sharing and them even like holding me while I cried and, you know, holding me in these moments of like, just, you know, you know pure wreckage in my life. Um, and, and I was like, how can we create a space for that? And so I started to play with this idea in my head, but I was kind of like a dog with bone with it, where it's just like, I couldn't let it up. I couldn't let it up. I couldn't let it up. And, and I decided to workshop this at a product course that was here in Toronto. I uh, ended up meeting my first co-founder through that after I made a presentation. He's like, I, I really want to help you do this. And, and we just started the journey of actually building Tether. We started with a Facebook group, uh, started experimenting with ideas in there, uh, decided that we were going to build an app. Uh, and then I, you know, I made the decision that I was going to sell my house to, to finance the, the, the starting of this app. So I, I sold my home. I moved into uh, a little apartment uh, with a couple of friends. I ended up moving into a basement apartment after that apartment to kind of keep things going. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to sell my apartment. I'm going to live off my savings that I was very fortunate to have. Um, and, and I was going to try and go and build this. Um, and then COVID hit. Uh, and so, you know, went into lockdown and, and, you know, we're all working remote. We're not seeing each other. And, and the need became even greater. And, you know, we started to put the pieces together and it was like, it was this daunting experience. I had never been in tech in my life. I had never built a mobile application. I had never been in mental health. Uh, I was still a wreck you know, probably like five days out of the week doing all of this. Uh, but we just continued to put the pieces together, you know, bit by bit. And um, what what I think it really sort of, what I thought we were really doing was we were ultimately creating a space where men could model positive attitudes towards vulnerability and struggle. Um, there's a lot of interesting statistics around men's mental health. Uh, I mean, everybody kind of knows the suicide statistic, which is like 75% of suicides are committed by men. Um, And that's like the big one that everyone kind of flashes. But I thought what was more interesting was that men were underutilizing mental health services by about 50% compared to women. If you looked at the digital therapy platforms, like 70% of their paid users were, were, were women, right? So there was all of these options out there, mental health, treatment, tech, was more accessible than ever and men still weren't using it, right? They still weren't doing it. And and the the, the sort of aha moment that I think we've had that we've been trying to work off of was that there was something inherently unmasculine about struggle to men, right? And and this kind of bears out in some of the studies where 
uh, you know, there, there was a study done by a couple of very famous male psychologists who study this issue of masculinity deeply. Uh, we're actually, uh, no, it wasn't that study, it was a different one. But this study basically pointed out that 73% of men feel that they need to solve their problems on their own. And so there's like this lone wolf mentality. There's something unmasculine if I can't fix my problems myself. And, and so what we've done is we've created a space where uh, we try and let men know that struggling doesn't make you any less of a man. It makes you human, right? And, and there's that old saying of, right, if you, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with a group, right? We want men to be like, you know, like, like put, it, put down the bag, man. Like put it down. You don't have to carry this alone. At least have another guy carry the other end of it because you're, you're not going to be able to do this forever. And, and I, I think what we've learned is not only is there uh, a deep need for this, but there's an inherent willingness for men to want to support each other. And I think it's very much hardwired into our brains. We are pack animals. We are creatures. Uh, being separated from the group historically meant that you died, right? We, we do better in community. We do better in groups. And, 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 and this idea of reaching out for help from other men has just been socialized right out of us. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can look at movies, you can look at books, you can look at, you know, magazines, TV shows, whatever. And, and the protagonist, the male protagonist is usually the guy who struggles, right? So he's on his hero's journey, he struggles, but somehow he manages to deal with it by himself, right? Or at least we perceive that he does it by himself, but you don't see all the we don't connect all of these other pieces of people that kind of help them along the way. So really what we want to do at our core is we want to provide that community where men can connect with other guys so that they don't have to carry the bag alone. I think that there's something profoundly liberating about that. And when you do start to meet other men who feel the same way, who have been through the same situations as you, and, and you can start to identify yourself in another human being, there's something profoundly um, cathartic about that. It's like you can breathe for the first time. You can take that deep breath and just go, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not fucked up. I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just like this other guy, right? It's like, we think that the thoughts in our head are so terminally unique, right? Um, and, and one of my, uh, one of my mentors uh, always says to me, it's like, the more unique the thought you think your thoughts are, the more universal they are, right? And so really the only barrier to us being able to identify ourselves and others and, and be able to experience that, that like that cathartic breath is to just simply open up and say, you know what, I'm struggling, I need a little bit of help, this is what I'm going through. And that's really all that's needed, I think, to start the process. It's <clears> such <throat> an interesting thing you, you talk on, there's so many questions I want to ask you. Uh, but I talked talk long, I'm sorry about that. If you ever just cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect, I was like, I'll do it, but I've just taken a few little uh, notes here but you it's spot on like we've become or adopted this belief that we need to work through things ourselves. it's like we're more of a man if we can overcome things and mm. I think you know breaking down the stigma around when we should ask for help I think even for my from my own experience and journey it's like if I'm clear on what I'm working towards and something becomes a problem meaning that it takes me too long to get to something so for example if I get a problem in business it's like mm. I allow myself fuck all time to sort it out because if, if it's going to take me a day i've just lost a day of productive work time so i need to ask my mentors or reach out for support same with relationship challenges or understanding my my health i know now what trying to figure it out over 10 days or two weeks will cost me so it's like well let's go to the people that are there whether it is a conversation because as you mm -hmm. said they're like the more unique we think our thoughts are the more universal they generally are and uh, there's all mm. what I've found as well from from reaching out and having conversations is there are definitely a lot of people who've walked the the path before me and why not fast track it it's it's the you know you update your phone every year Apple brings out a new phone not because your hardware is broken or it's useless it's just like you want the next update so why don't we continue mm -hmm. to give ourselves the updates from peer, peer support because as much as I love um, you know study and research that it, it there's something about hearing someone's journey and the struggle as, as you sort mm -hmm. of touched on with yours that you're like, holy fuck. Like when you were telling your story, I was like, man, we have so much in common. Um, mm -hmm. It's just blown me away because there are so many different things we can do to, um, I guess, 
seek help and seek support, but it's about finding what's going to really work for us. And sometimes it's standing right next to us, next to us right? It might be mm-hmm. our mates um, with that. But going back to, you know, when you were struggling with the, uh, after your mate sort of passed away from that point, when you were building the skills, like in, in your career, learning sales, learning marketing, learning how to communicate better, were you still feeling and experiencing that sense of loneliness or was the act of actually growing and improving yourself, helping you feel more connected? Uh, it's interesting because this has not only been the most beautiful and connected experience of my life, it's also been the most isolating. Um, building a company from scratch, um, you know, I, I have I have wonderful co-founders, right? But there's there's just certain things that you have to experience by yourself, right? There's, there's only so much that you can put on another person. Um, and then there are things that you, you, you genuinely need to just feel and experience and go through alone. Um, and to train your system, your nervous system, to understand that, it, you, that you are safe, that it is okay, um, and that you can survive these things. It's, um, you know, uh, uh, somebody told me, it's like, it's like getting punched in the face, right? Like if you're, uh, uh, if you've ever been punched in the face, you're terrified of getting in a fight and then you get punched in the face once and you're like, oh, okay, that's not that bad, right? Like you, you, you got knocked and you're like, and, and for some reason you're like, you just become more emboldened, but you need to have those things happen to you repeatedly in order for you to build the neural wiring to be able to withstand it. And I think I'm still developing that right now. Um, it's been hugely isolating and not just because of COVID. And, and that was a big part of it, I think, for me, is I, I definitely work better around people, right? I definitely work better in a team. I definitely work better uh, when there is like an energetic exchange that can really only happen in person. Like we, we have this thing going back and forth right now, but there is something lost because this is happening over Zoom, right? Um, there is something nice like if we were able to do this in a studio obviously i mean if you could fly me down to australia i'm sure you would um and and in normal times that's what would have happened i'm 100 percent certain but my, my point is is like sitting in the studio and doing this there, there's subtleties uh in, in terms of our body language in terms of the energetic interaction that we have that would we, we'd be able to sort of play off so that's been a huge part of this for me um in terms of like learning the skill set i'm very much an experiential learner doing it, talking to someone, playing with something that's kind of like, I, I'm not as much of a book learner about that kind of stuff. I kind of just like, uh, I'm intense. I jump, I just like throw myself into it and kind of figure it out on the fly. But um, I, I think for me, what was isolating about this experience uh, in particular was um, this feeling that, um, you know, that I had all of this responsibility and I didn't want to let people down, that I felt that I had this mission, this responsibility, uh, this job uh, to, to heal as many people and to bring as many people into this network as possible. And it never felt like I was quite doing enough. And that was kind of my own thing. And, and, and really what that was, was a reflection of my own feeling of lack of worthiness that I had about myself, right? If, if you constantly feel like you're not enough, then nothing that you do will ever be enough. And so being able to actually slow down, uh, to be able to tell myself that I am enough, uh, to, to even drop out of the egoic you know, process that is spinning on, I'm not enough, what do I have to do, all of that kind of stuff. And just like being able to locate that experience in my body. Oh shit, my chest is tight. Oh shit, I've got this, this like knot in my stomach trying to drop away the story and really go into the sensory experience um, and allowing my nervous system to soften, allowing, you know, my, my, my system to wind down a little bit and, and to be able to drop into the I am in all of this, right? The, the eternal I am, which is like whatever this moment is. That's been the most challenging part of this entire thing. And I think, you know, one of the things that a lot of startup founders that I've met are wired with is this constant need to achieve. Um, and I think sometimes it comes from a good place. I think some, a lot of times uh, it comes from a very unhealthy place um, of wanting and craving and needing validation. And, and the validation becomes your business, right? You, I, you identify so strongly with the business itself that the failure of the business becomes your failure as a human being. And so I think that there's a, there is an interesting learning process in that of actually being able to detach myself 
from my business and to be able to exist as two different things, Matt, the founder, and then Matt, just Matt, right? That was kind of really interesting. And, and that work was done by myself. I, I had support therapists, coaches, people that I could call on. But ultimately, when, when the needle started to really move in terms of being able to deal with the vagaries of starting a business, starting a startup, what, what really was important for me was being able to, um, I call it emotionally metabolizing, right? Being able to be with something that you, your nervous system and your brain is like, this is going to kill you, man. You should really like stop this, right? Like stop this, quit, throw in the towel. You, you know, you, you'd be much better off working as a barista. Like you should definitely do that. Serving coffee is absolutely your purpose in life. That, that seems a lot safer. But when you can actually be with that experience in its fullness with a feeling that, uh, that you feel like is, is completely unfeelable, unbearable, and then to be able to see that come to its natural end, to its natural conclusion, that gives you a sense of power in yourself that is really kind of unrivaled. And still, I would say, it's like, I still play with that every single day. Like just before this, I, 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 you know, maybe an hour ago, I was on a call because we were doing some work and we were figuring out this issue and, and that, that little hamster wheels is going pretty hard. And I needed to like go away, sit down, be with myself for 10 minutes so that I could come on here and actually be present with you and like, you know, actually give you something that wasn't just me being a miserable fuck about shit, right? <laughs> like I, that was, that was my, that was my edge, right? In that moment. And, and I got through it. And now, you know, this is a lot of fun, right? So it's, it's, it's a relationship, right? That, that I think the, the thing that we think is that like, there's this end point. And, and I always think that it's like, what do I have to do? Like, what's the, what's the healing modality? Where do I have to go? How much, you know, how many sit-ups do I need to do before I'm not mentally ill anymore? Like, really, that's the question, right? There's this great meme that I saw the other day, and it's just like, you know, cleaned my room, took a shower. I am no longer mentally ill. And it was just like, that's totally it. Like, when you do that one thing, you're like, oh, it's taken care of. And then it sneaks back around the corner the next day. So it, it's, it's really, for me, this has been about developing a relationship with myself, with my mind, with my experience, with what I tell myself. Uh, but the worthiness piece is, is the hardest thing. And I think that's something that we have to confront in, in um, because it, it, it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's a function of something that we weren't given as children. And, and there's like, when we feel unworthy, there's just this, this is feeling like I'm not safe, right? Like I need something. Right. And, and typically it was like you needed to hear something or get something as a child. It wasn't met through no fault of your parents or anybody around you. It's just like that's that's kind of what happens. We all have these little some of us have really big T capital T traumas. Right. Where it's like this big event or just a compounded series of horrible life experiences that are objectively bad that happen to you. And for some of us, I it's. It's just unmet needs. It's like a bad, you know, a bullying experience and then some unmet needs. And then, you know, a parent through no fault of their own because they're having a bad day, kind of pushing you to the side because they just can't handle it. And then you internalize that as something that was wrong with you. And it was nothing wrong with you. It was just, they couldn't handle it that day. Um, and so that builds up. And when you, I think when we finally get to this, this point in our lives where we are adults, we, we are now responsible for our own emotional experience. And that safety and that, that validation that we always needed when we were a child that we never got, we now have to give it to ourselves and nobody else can give it to us. Not a business, not a romantic partner, not a friend, nobody. We have to start to learn how to give that to ourselves. And, and that starts by being able to actually admit to others that you need help, that things aren't okay. Because if it's all bottled up and you can never just say to somebody and you can never let somebody hold you in that space and say, you know what, you're like, I understand you, I feel you. You can't begin to develop that relationship because if somebody else shows you that they're not, they're not like they're broken, quote unquote, none of us are broken. But my point being is like, if, if they can show you that they have even a little bit of what you think is so terminally unique to you, you can start to be like, I'm not the only one. And then 
you can start to like the isolation is gone. You're like, okay, I'm not, I'm not completely abnormal. Now I can start to build a relationship with us. And then as you go on, it's about building that relationship with yourself whilst having the support of a great community around you. And I think that's where Tether is. It, it facilitates that journey towards wholeness. It facilitates that journey towards reconnecting with that part of you that is always good and whole and, and complete. Um, and that it takes some time, man. It's been about two years for me. And I, I feel like I'm still, you know, tripping over my feet and biting my tongue uh, every time I get up in the morning. So it's when you were saying um, like there's all these unmet, unmet needs that we have as, as people. And I think we've lost the ability or some of us never really realized that we need to start asking ourselves better questions and we need to, you know, touch mm. them and start being the ones who are in control of our own uh, emotions and well being and all of that sort of stuff moving forward. And what, um, from my experience, you know, going into men's groups and, and just listening and going, holy shit, that person's been through what I've been through. It then makes me go, I want to ask him, you know, how he overcame it. Or I want to ask what that felt like. Mm -hmm. I want to ask what held him back. And what we're just actually learning to do is begin to ask better questions, right? And the more questions we can ask ourselves, the, you know, generally the better the question they say, the better the answer. And for us to understand mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're feeling, what we're sitting with, what needs aren't being met, all comes off the back of questions. Mm -hmm. like the beauty of that peer supported stuff, which with, so with what you're doing at Tether is like, you get to learn from men from all walks of life who've you know, had so many incredible experiences and they may be talking about something that you actually are going through that you didn't even realize. Cause you know, mm -hmm. I love to, as you, you mentioned with our, our brands, like, fuck that, I'm going to die. Run, 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 run. Anything that feels yeah. uncomfortable. So we never really get the opportunity to, to sit there and go, what is actually fucking going on here? I mm -hmm. think we need to, to figure it all out. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the communication piece and the ownership piece is such a powerful thing, but having that peer support to walk side by side with you to realize that you're not alone is, is huge. When you first, re I guess, 2018, when you first needed help, was it hard for you to reach out for help or did you, you know, was it just like, cool, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um I, I think actually I want to talk about asking better questions because I think that point is is really really interesting um I don't know I felt like I was like a, like an open sore walking around in so many ways like it had gotten to this place uh for me at least where it, it like it my experience felt so painful to me um and it was so unbearable in some ways like just like the physiological stuff like you know, being like having a chest and body that felt so tight that I was like, I, I'm all I can do is pace. Like I was just, I would pace around my apartment. Like I, I couldn't think I couldn't function like, you know, get, you know, getting food. I, it was like, it, I was barely able to make myself a meal at that point. Cause it just, it, it felt overwhelming. So I was like an exposed nerve in some ways walking around. Um, and, and so I think for me, it just, it got to the point where all of this stuff had built up for so long over time that it was like, if I don't do this, it's, it's just not like nothing's getting better, right? Like this is only getting worse right now. I need to do something about it. And like, I had been in therapy before I knew about reaching out for help, but there was something very different about being vulnerable, being vulnerable enough. And you talk about going to men's groups. I, I am I still, that men's group that I went to in 2019, um, I, I guess, all, no, I guess it's, no, it started in 2018. November 2018 was when I first went to that men's group. I still sit with those same five guys till today, right? We, we still meet every two weeks, right? And they are my lifeline. And we've been through the failure of a business of another member, uh, a divorce, uh, you know what I mean? Me starting my business and all the turbulation that came with that. Like, you know, people having just like consistent anxiety, like we've been through so much, like two, like, I think three kids have been born in that time or something like that yeah, in the, in this group of guys, like, and it, it's, it's, it's been like, it's been so real and so needed. And like, I think the one thing that we say to each other at the end, it's like, fuck without you guys, like, I don't know where, <laughs> I don't know where I would be like, you know, give me, give me a rickety stool and like eight feet of rope because like you know i wouldn't have gone through the 
the the pandemic in the same way that I would have like I I, I was at, at times like at, at just the end of it right like I just couldn't do it anymore um, and it was those guys being able to go and say to them and to have coaches like you know I've worked with coaches I've done like you know uh, like extensive men's retreats online stuff but being able to be you know to actually allow yourself to fully like um, I guess the term is to like to just give up like it's not give up but it's like to let yourself collapse, collapse is the word I'm looking for, right? To let yourself collapse fully into that feeling of helplessness, into that feeling of I can't go on, into that feeling, and to allow your, and to allow that feeling to overwhelm your system, and then to know that the water only comes up to your chin. That's the that's the thing, right? It's like the water never goes over your head. It comes up to here. It feels like you're going to drown, but then it starts to recede and then it's at your chest and then it's at your belly button and then it's at your waist and then it's at your knees and sh- soon enough you're walking out of the water right and and that's kind of like what i think the experience of like fully experiencing what we go through is it's like we feel like it like if we actually let it happen it's going to kill us right um and and it's and, but on the other side of that somatic experiencing, like allowing that, it's like it actually washes things through in your body that are stuck, right? And we hold a lot of our trauma, a lot of our pain uh, in our bodies. And so to, I think so many men are so disconnected, like we spend so much time up here in our thinking brains and solving and problem solving and figuring out what needs to get done and, and what do I have to do and pushing on that we very rarely allow ourselves to slow down and experience whatever it is that's going on for us right now. And that ability to drop in, it, you know, the ability to embody, the ability to slow down, the ability to, um, to actually work with the energy that's circulating in your body, to work with that sense of overwhelm in you um, and to do so in a way that's productive and healthy and cathartic, I think that's what really leads to, to integration and, and to being, and this is something I still work on. Like I, I, I still have a lot of insecurities. I still have a lot of neuroses. I still, uh, I still don't feel like, uh, you know, I'm worthy of, you know, a lot of stuff, right? But what I do have the ability to do today is I have the ability to sit with that, right? And I don't have to necessarily you know, I, I have a group of men that I can go to that when I sit with them, right, I know, I know that I can let go. That's the, I think the power of that group. And that's the power of peer support. It's that when you find that right group, that right space, it gives you the permission to say, I don't have to do this all by myself. Can you guys please just hold me for a second? And that, that can just be holding space. That can be like physically, literally holding someone. And you see like, sacred sons, a lot of guys that do this work, there are like practices where they will hold each other up and allow men to like fully collapse into that experience and to know that they're supported. And there's something very nourishing about that to our bodies and our nervous system to allow ourselves to do that. And I think that's really the power of tether and peer support and finding these spaces in these groups is that you, is that you can allow yourself to unravel to let it pass through you. And then what happens after that, it's actually really funny, is like you actually come back stronger, right? You're, you're more focused, right? You're, you're, you're more grounded. There's so much benefit to that. And that I think is the process of, and I don't wanna call it becoming a stronger man, but it, it's, 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 that's, the, that's the healing process. That's the journey, right? And that's, I think, what allows us to start to um, to really get in touch with that part of us that we lost when we were children, that that natural ability to just be and exist and experience and love and care and support and be men of action, right? Like being able to act from that place is hugely powerful, right? Uh, it, it's not anger. It's not like, it's not all of these, you know, negative things that we associate with men. It's actually acting from a place of truly embodied power. And I think we also need to reframe that in society. You know, masculinity is not toxic, right? Masculinity is not a problem. The, the problem 
is that you have all of these men walking around who are wounded little boys that don't feel like they have anybody that they can talk to and don't feel like their feelings are valid. And so the power of these types of communities and this work is to let these men know, to re-experience, to learn how to feel again. And in that, they start to drop deeper and deeper into what I would call this positive masculine energy, which is which wants to protect, which wants to provide, which wants to love, which wants to do all of these things, but from such a pure and beautiful place. And I think that's that's the, the shift that we're making with, with apps like Tether, with men's groups, with all of this work is returning men to that like deeply empowered and, and grounded space where they can be the strong men that, that we really want and need in society. I agree with, uh, with that toxic masculinity and really allowing blokes to, to get to the point where they can sit with themselves. Because I, I look think about it with retirement, right? A lot of people are, are working their nine to five uh, kind of lifestyle and they're like when I retire I'll do this I'll do that I'll, and I'll put everything off to it but even just the the ability to think that you're going to finish work and just be able to switch off and just relax it's not going to happen because your nervous system no. has been functioning in a certain way for majority of your life and the same thing with your emotions like if you're going to just go okay as you were saying just learn to sit with yourself it's fucking uncomfortable right and your brain mm. will do anything to get yourself out of that position it might be like I've got to do this. Or I've got to do that. Or maybe I, even for me, like it might be actually, maybe I should read or maybe I should do this. And it's, it's still its mm-hmm. own form of distraction and avoidance from actually just being able to sit mm-hmm. and, you know, sit with what's going on and really actually feel it. Because as you said, it's one of the most powerful things. Like when you were saying, you know, you feel like you're going to drown for me. It's like, I'm jumping in a nice warm bath and it's just coming up to the neck. And eventually once you just accept it, like it's the most, therapeutic experience and you walk away going i want more of that Mm -hmm. and it it is just the fact that we are learning to you know being being in the masculine is is we learn to lead our life but we don't have to be dominating we don't have to be controlling it's just like we get to be assertive in what we want and enforcing boundaries and um, uh, directing our life but we get to empower and bring people with us which is you know, as you said, there's a lot of men that are still, I think majority of men are still boys. They, you know, we go from having our mums or our parents do everything for us and we leave school and we find a relationship where hopefully that our relationship starts doing everything for us. And we never, you know, rites of passage, right? That's another thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think are fantastic is like, we never have a rite of passage anymore, especially if you grow up in a city, right? You just go from school to university generally, um, or your trade or whatever. And then it's like life. When do we ever get taught how to be a man? Because the role models we have prior, as you said uh, earlier, Maddie, and it's no fault of our parents or anything because they're coming from their own experiences and what needed to happen. But that, that has been happening in tribes for centuries. Mm-hmm. We never get the ability yeah. to go, you know, no <clears throat> me lucky. you need to learn to fend for yourself because I've always had lifelines around. Me. I've been fortunate. And mm-hmm. So creating, creating spaces where you, you know, have to have those conversations, you have to learn to sit with it because we're, we're looking for that fulfillment. We're looking for that connection, but we're not sitting through the shit to be able to ever experience it. But the mm. moment that you, you know, and I think logic on paper to even people maybe who are listening to this, Maddie, and they go, yeah, yeah it all makes sense. It's good for Maddie. It's good for Lockie. Um, <laughs> logically it's like oh if i do that cool but how do i just learn to surrender like how do i do that and someone actually mm-hmm. asked me uh, a few weeks ago it's it's you know what's the point of a you know attending a men's group or something like that for me it was like actually walking into a specific space where the intention was for me to feel comfortable communicating or even just learn how other people are communicating mm-hmm. and the i guess the question I have for you is and one thing that you already answered for me was you're still sitting with the same group of blokes that you did three years ago or whatever it was, which is yeah. some people might come in and then walk away. You might do a little bit and think you're fixed and you're good to go, but it's like, a ongoing, yeah. it's an ongoing thing that you need to, to develop. Right. And you've been doing that for years. And with those blokes that you've gone through so much with that, do you have the sole relationship of, you know, you go there meet up fortnightly and, um, talk about what's going on or are you are you mates outside of you know that that meetup yeah it's it's so interesting because it's like um that's like our time together 
And it's like, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, like I, I, I uh, actually one of them, I, I got to get back to him actually. I, he just messaged me on WhatsApp and we're going to, we're going to try and play some tennis this weekend together. Uh, and we've gone on uh, like one of the night we, we didn't see each other in person for a year. And then we went on a walk with each other and there, there was no work that we were doing. We were just like, let's go, let's be in nature. Let's walk around for four hours together and have a beer at the end. Right. Like it was that like, I totally love spending time with those guys, but the majority of our time together has been in this room. There's always time afterwards and you just kind of chit chat and whatever, but there's, there's so much, you know, fulfillment in those, in those moments together and in those conversations um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I've gone down on men's retreats with them, but like so much of our, our relationship, I think because of how we met is, is, is wrapped around this work. And so I think it's like, we know that we're each other's safe space where when we can go to that. And um, I, I, I look forward to being friends and connected with these guys you know, for many, 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 many years, I have no intention of going back. But what's nice is like with that group, it's like, you, and you mentioned it, right? It's like you go, you do it a little bit, and then you think you're fixed, right? But it's like, how do you constantly sit at that edge, right? Because one of the nice things I think about the guys that we sit with is that it's a group of guys that are constantly at their edge, right? Whether it's in fatherhood, whether it's in business, um, you know, two of the guys are men's coaches or uh, one, sorry, one's a relationship coach. One's a, a men's coach. The other's a podcaster and an author. Uh, the other guy works in tech. Right. Uh, but we're all people that want to be at our edge. We want to be growing. We want to be experiencing more. Um, and, and we want we want that experience to continually be deepening over time, uh, not only with each other, but our relationships with ourselves. Um, and I think just very like even like in COVID, right? It's just, it's been necessary. We've all, you know, struggled through COVID and, and this pandemic and being isolated from each other. And the heart, one of the hardest things, um, it, you know, two of the hardest things is not being able to go to, uh, you know, to the Banya on Sundays, which was something I used to do where it was like the hot and the cold and that release and that like real intensive, like working out of my system and then not being able to actually like hug these guys and like to do the work that we do together. Um, but it's like, there's always something, right? That's the thing is like, it's a journey. There's always something, there's always going to be another thing. And so the question, like, it, I think that's the mindset, right? The mindset is that like, we do this because we love each other. We care about each other. We want to be around each other, but we also want to be at our edge. We also want to be growing. We also want to be handling our, like we want to be showing up for our businesses, our relationships, our families in a way that is empowered, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, my relationship with, you know, my family has changed profoundly because of this. My ability to go through, a, you know, starting a business, which is the hardest thing that I've ever done, um, ha has changed. And my relationship to work is, is changing over time. Uh, and then my relationships to other friends and to myself. And, and, it, and it's because I consistently sit. It's because I consistently come back. And it's because we consistently ask the, each other the same questions. How does that feel in your body, right? When you say that, where do you feel tightness? What's the emotion that's coming up around this, right? And so we're not just there to, you know, be like, oh, shit, you know, uh, my partner did this, you know, uh, this is going wrong in the business, whatever. But it's like when that's happening, it's like, okay, slow down. What, like that, that reaction that you had, that, that thing that you said, what's coming up for you right now? And then you close your eyes, you slow down, you go into it more, right? And it, it reminds you to reconnect with yourself, but it also gives us that practice, those reps, that somatic experiencing, that emotional metabolization. It's just, it's so important. And so, you know, I, I wish that every man in the world had a group of five guys that they could consistently sit with because I, I just, I know the world would be a better place if that was the case. hundred percent agree more, even just listening to some of the language in your, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking back to like myself, 2014 and, you know, sitting with, Oh, what's that? What's that you're experiencing for me? That is like, I don't want to talk about those sorts of things. That's not a uh, blokey to talk about those sorts of things. And you, yeah. I, I guess I read somewhere on, 
on your um, Instagram somewhere was like making the hard conversations easier. And for me, like, back in the day that would have been a conversation and I think for a lot of blokes listening to this as well like hearing how you speak about that you know everyone's obviously in different stages with how they sit with those sorts of questions but for you and from the conversations that you've had and what you're doing with Tether how have you made those conversations easier for not only for yourself but for for other people oh wow that's a, that's a loaded question um I think <laughs> I for me right for you bro <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 it's good. I, I, it, you're testing to see if my brain's still working at this hour. Um, okay, so I think for me, it's that I'm willing to have those conversations. And like, okay, so like, let, let's give an example, right? When something triggers you, when somebody gaslights you, when, you know, uh, whatever that is, right? Maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a partner, whoever that is in your life, right? And they say something and it's like, and you feel it, right? Your chest tightens. You want to like react, right? Like you're 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 ready to pounce. You're ready to go. Like you motherfucker. You always blow and with like whatever your reaction is, and you're just ready to react, right? And and the power of this is that you can actually and and I've kind of like I've had a hard time learning this, right? Um, but what's more, what's more and more interesting is like, I also realize when I'm doing something or I'm in a relationship or I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with someone because I'm needing validation. Right. And that's the thing is whenever, uh, you know, or, and, and this is the problem is, and you know, John Wineland uh, talks about this a lot is nobody is ever going to make you feel safe. Nobody right? If you're relying on other people to make you feel safe, because like that, when we're arguing, when we're fighting, when we're cussing people out, what we're basically saying is like, you're not making me feel safe. You need to do this so that I can feel better, right? And guess what? It's not their fucking responsibility, right? And, and they didn't make you feel that way. You felt that way. That was your fucking response, right? That's your shit. That's your problem. That's your trigger. Right. And so even if they've done something wrong, it's not their job to fix it. It's your job to fix it. And so even just having that mindset, like, I mean, you can, you know, I, I mean, I could think of endless number of situations where it's like, you want to say to somebody, you know, don't do this because it makes me feel like this. And it's like, no, it doesn't make you feel like this. You feel like this because you're feeling triggered or because it's bringing up a childhood wound or because you need validation, right? You can say, when you say this, or when you do this, I feel this, that's fine. But nobody makes you feel a certain way to, to, to actually be able to learn to own your feelings in any given situation. And then also to realize that the person that you're dealing with is also traumatized. Like we're all traumatized to some degree or another, right? And, 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 I think I posted this like, you know, the other day, it's like, when you start, when you start to realize that we're all just traumatized people doing the best we can, you start to have a lot more compassion for the fucked up shit that people do and say, right? And, and, and you start to actually be able to be like, oh, man, you're reacting like that. What the, what fucking happened to you that made you feel like that? I feel bad for you. No, I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? Like you actually be able to like play with it and learn to like detach. And like, this is not to say that I'm like, there's particular things like my relationship with my family, very hard for me to do that. Right. And there's that old saying, it's like, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your family. Right. And all your stuff will start to come up. But I, I know that now. And I can also be like, hmm, I need to be alone for 15 minutes or 20 minutes right now. Like I need to go take a walk outside. Like I need like a break because otherwise I'm just going to tear into somebody and like, that's not going to be good for anybody. But I think like this radical ownership of how you feel and your own emotional experience is so important. And it's really powerful because then when you don't rely on anybody to make you feel safe or to make you which ultimately that's all the, this comes down to is like, we're all just looking to be made to feel safe or we all just want to feel safe. And really that's just our nervous system, right? It's like our, it's that fight or flight. We right. just want to feel that nervous system, that fight or flight thing to go right to like that breath, right? That relaxation. When you start to realize that it is your responsibility solely to do that for yourself 
and that it's actually kind of fun to be able to learn how to do that. And it's kind of also really awesome to be able to be that person who's like, you, you just can't fuck with me because like, I'm, I'm the one who's in control of it. And this is something I'm learning to do day by day by day. I'm getting better at it by no means perfect. I still have a lot of work to do on this. And, and I totally like, even today I had this, you know, Oh, what's wrong with me? Like I fucking can't do this. Can't do that. When is my life going to, you know, when am I going to meet a partner? You know I mean? I, I'm a bag of shit. Like who would want to be with me? All that kind of stuff. But I knew in that moment, I was like, okay, I know this. And I went and I sat and I just set my timer. I, I use inside timer and I, I sat in 20 minutes and I was like, okay, what's going on? Okay. My chest is really tight. Okay. I feel unworthy. <sighs> okay. Okay, I don't want to feel this right now. Okay, you got to feel this right now. Like this is the conversation that's going through. I was like, okay, breathe, buddy. You're doing good. You're doing good. <laughs> and 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 there's like this moment where the switch kind of fucking flips, and you're just like, all right, I can get back to my day. Like nothing's changed. The still the problems are still there. The the frustration is still there. But it's like, okay, I can continue going. And for me, I think, and, and what, from what I've learned and the, like, I'm going based off faith, right? Like I'm going based off guys that have come before me. They're like, no, no, no. That's the thing that you're supposed to do. It's going to be fine. Right. I'm like, oh, are you sure? It doesn't feel good. And like, yeah, no, keep going. I'm like, ah, but I don't really want it. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Keep going. And like, the more I do that, right. The more that I actually just keep doing, it, I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that is, that is the way that is the path. That is the thing I have to do is, is to not fix it but to simply be with it and to let it naturally resolve itself. Um, and, and that's, that's like, that's the real ninja shit that like, I'm like, that I really want to learn is like, how do I just do that? Right. And how do I also cut the time down the, that, that space between um, I'm a, I'm a, like an emotional wreck and a bag of shit and, and, and to like, okay, I'm okay again. Like, you know, how can I, and then how can I have more peace, longer extended periods of peace, less anxiety, but like being able to do that with myself. And that's something that I've only ever learned by being able to do the work with other men and to have been, I think, courageous enough to take that first step of being like, I'm not okay. Being able to say I'm not okay and actually reaching out and being able to own that part of my experience and say, I need help right now that has opened the door for all of this. I think that's why we resist it so much though, is because we think we have to fix it rather than learning to just be with it. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I find even for myself, cause when you're saying that tightness of the chest and it's like, I just want it to go away. I need to fix this shit. But it's like, if you literally yeah. go meditate or sit <laughs> for a moment, you just can go back to breathing and you're like, oh. and then you're like, Oh, it's gone. But hey, when fuck I, me, that was easy. Yeah. When, but when I'm going through it, I'm like, fuck, if I just complete this task, if I just do this, then it'll go away. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. This, I'm building this checklist that I feel I need to do to release the pressure. But when in reality, it's just like, I just need to do what you said. But, you know, I, I'm very similar to you, whereas I know these things work. But when I'm going through that moment, it's like I resist it like all fucking hell because I'm like, mm -hmm. no, I can just push through a little bit more and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter to like, mm -hmm the only thing left to do is go sit down and you know sit in the garden or go for a surf or something like that to just breathe and yeah sit with it but let's like, I, i'm the, i'm the dumbest smart person i know like i i've learned this lesson over and over and over again and i still fucking resist it because who wants to sit with it it's uncomfortable and i think we are naturally inclined as men to to want to fix something it is not in our nature and i don't think it's in human it's not in our, in our, in our wirings nature to, because like, like when we're in that state of fight or flight, right, that system has been attuned to actually run away from a predator, right, to do something, to take an action. And it's been completely co-opted in the modern world um, by, you know, it's like, oh man, uh, I'm feeling super anxious and like super like shitty about myself. Uh, because that person on Instagram is in fucking Cancun on a boat uh, and I'm sitting here, um, you know, eating a can of tuna and uh, I just got to kind of get back to work after this and I need a meal. 
It's like, well, my life doesn't look like that. And then we get super anxious. Like, oh, I'm not enough and all this kind of stuff. And it's like in that moment, there is no threat. There's no objective threat. There's only an imagined threat in that moment. And so the fight or flight is like, I got to do something about it. But like, what are you going to do? They're in Cancun. You're not like (laughs) tough shit. You know what I mean? Like you're not going there today. And, you know, maybe you're not going there for a while, right? But, like, that feeling, that, that, sis, that system, your, that feeling in your body is still fucking there. And you still got to deal with that shit, right? And so it's, like, in those moments, it's, like, the only thing to do is to surrender and just to allow it to be there. Because there's no saber-toothed tiger that's waiting around the corner to kill you. That's probably ties back into what you're doing and Tether and everything like that. Because if you if you are still continuing to resist and it goes day by day. you know you're talking about how do we minimize the time but if it goes day by day or week by week that you're carrying that tightness and that that stress and that anxiety mm. it's like sometimes you need some other perspective or someone to you know give you a clip over the back of the head to make you aware of your blind spots so i'd be like bro mm. if i can sit down for a moment you've been going like a bat out of a hell bat out of hell yeah and that's why like i think it's so awesome that you're still sitting with the same people because they're there to do exactly that like we can especially you're a business owner i'm a business owner it's very easy to put your blinders on and just feel like you've got to go you know because there's Mm. invested time you've invested money you're mission driven um but having those people there who can just you know you make that time to sit you make that time to connect and you get to i guess get it all off your chest reset refresh yourself and go again Mm -hmm. and and those guys know me like the fucking back of and and what's nice about the consistency of that is they can also reflect back to me like dude you you were like you were like a mess when we first met you (laughs) and like it was like we were worried like we were worried that like we need to call somebody else no i'm kidding like but like they they said like it's like the the really the best thing about that right is that they've been able to say to me on multiple occasions hearing like and i'm saying something that it feels to me like the world is fucking falling in on me right and they say to me like but the way that you're talking about this is so different from a year ago the way that you are verbalizing this the way that you are interacting with this right like the pace at which you talk about this, right? I, 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 I think it was, um, you know, we had, we had something, you know, we had something sort of go wrong, you know, a month and a half ago. And, and whenever something goes wrong, you know, this is business owner, it feels like the end of the world. You're like, the roof's caving in, you know, uh, the, you know, the fire, it's like that meme with the dog with the burning house in the background where you're just like, it's fine, right? And everything's on fire, right? And you're just reacting. Um, but it, it, it was like, I was talking about it and I was like, I'm like, I feel angry. I'm, I'm like, I'm frustrated. I feel powerless in this situation. Um, my chest is tight. Like I want to scream, right? Whereas before I'd be like, and this, and, and it's like, and it was like really, really quick, but I was like slow. And I was like, no, and I'm, I'm upset. And like, I feel unworthy and I feel like a fucking mess. And, but it was like, it was just... I don't know how to describe it, but it was different. But, but having that be able to be reflected back to me, right, is so powerful because they're not there to fix me, right? Like I said, right, it's my job to own my experience and to own my emotions. But they can reflect back to me, dude, the way that you're reacting and interacting with this is so completely different than you a year ago, two years ago three years ago. Like I I was like this detached, you know, checked out ball of like anxiety. And it was just like, you know, like I, I I would just go out back to my car, drive home and just collapse into bed after these meetings. Right. I just, I had nothing left in the tank. Um, But like, this is, this is the resilience, right. And this is what people talk about with resilience. And it's also, I, and now I'm about to go on a diatribe with like, like you know, uh, like, it, you know, you just got to think positive and you've got to visualize and you've got to, you know, you, you know, think and manifest that whole thing. And it's like, you can't do any of that if you haven't actually learned how to be with your experience. 
Mm. Right. Because it's always going to come back up. And then it's like, do I act from a place of like lack of tightness of anxiety of fear? Or do I experience the fear, the anxiety, the tightness, the lack, allow it to pass through me and then be like, okay, that's not reality. Okay, I'm still here. Okay, I'll be fine regardless of how this, this pans out. Okay, now what do I do? Mm. Right? That's the flip, right? It's not that you're not going to go through that thing. It's that you'll be able to increasingly over time you know, decrease the intensity and the magnitude and the number of events that that happens. And you'll be able to live more and more and more in that flow, in that peace, in that beautiful state where it's just like, oh yeah, now I'm going to do some email. Oh yeah. Oh shit. That person needs something. Oh fuck that customer, you know, something burned to the ground there. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to do that. I'm going to deal with that thing. Or you actually don't, end up being so reactive it's like you know what that customer that's got the problem normally i would react and be like is everything okay but like i'm just like i'm gonna leave that that guy till tomorrow life you know the world's not gonna end his life's not gonna come crashing down around him i'll email him in the morning i've got some more because then you can prioritize you can be like yes that feels important but this is actually critical Mm. right and 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 then you're just like i don't know that's where I want to get to. It's like, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I can see that that's like possible, right. To be able to see like, there's this fire burning and it really wants my attention. And I'm like, no, when I'm done this, then I will do that. And you can wait until I'm done. Yep. Right. And to be able to manage your attention like that is again, it's just, it's like, you know, other, because before I was just like, Oh, that's on fire. I'll go do that. Oh, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, squirrel, right? Like anything that popped up in my, in my attention or my thing was like the next thing that I was going to do. Now I have the capacity to do deep work. I have the capacity to be like for two hours, I do just this. Mm. And, and even, I've even tried to simplify it even more. It's like, in, you know, people say, oh, I got my, I got my five things to do today. I'm like a one thing a day guy. And I like that a lot. <laughs> like I really like that a lot I'm like and that doesn't mean I don't work for 10 hours some days but like but like when I when I do that one thing it's like I get a lot of it done and at the end of the day I'm like fuck yeah man go take a walk around the block you you deserve that you deserve that fucking break and even now I've started to think about like man one thing a week because like it's, it's not just the one thing it's the 70 other things that fall underneath that one you say I got to get this out, but then there's all the subtasks, yep. right? And you don't, uh, you don't accurately calculate for that either. But anyways, now I'm going off on a bit of a tangent around like entrepreneurship and stuff like that, but it's like doing this and actually being able to metabolize it. It's like, it gives you that ability. And, and one of my mentors talks about like, you know, like, you know, need to have, want to have, nice to have, right? Which is like another way of saying like critical important and you know add your third thing there right the stuff that's like will grab our attention but it's like if we don't do it it's like not the end of the world and like they're going to be pissed off but then it's like yeah okay like that'll be fine yeah you'll get over it it's fine i I have confidence in you right (laughs) so tell it tell us about tether and how how it all works and how the community is built yeah, so it's a so what we built is a peer enabled uh, emotional fitness and community platform, and and what I think is really important for men is to understand that this is part of your health and well being, right? So like I I don't want you to think that because you're engaging in this work that there's something inherently wrong or damaged about you, right? Like this is work that we all need to be doing, right? And it's, and it's, it's part of our growth. It's part of our evolution. It's part of that hero's journey. So what we want to be able to do is we want to give men tools, right? Where they can interact and they can learn how to form positive daily habits around checking in with their emotions. Because this is something that I do daily. And like, I, you know, I sit two or three times a day for 10 to 20 minutes if something comes up because I have to. Like, that's part of my job. Like, otherwise, I'm just like, I'm running around like a fucking chicken with a head cut off. Like, 
I, and I, and you know, in that state, I'm not making good decisions. And you know, in that state, I'm not optimal. I'm not doing good work. I'm not focused, right? So learning how to be with and metabolize your own emotions is a daily practice, right? And so it's really important that we do that. We have our emotional fitness tracker, which is a mood-based checking in system. You pick how you're feeling that day. We give you some options. You say what this is related to and you, you enter that into the app. So that's one big part of it. Then you have the threads, right? So the threads, we have you pick an emotion first because uh, men need a little bit of help and prompting to figure out what they're feeling. Uh, there is a, a disorder called, uh, I think it's called a male, male, male alexithymia. So alexithymia is basically an inability to identify one's emotions. And men are so bad at it that there's a strand of it that's just for men. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's like, you guys are really special. Here's your own disorder around identifying your emotions. So what we want to do is we want to actually be able to guide them in, in order, like, how do you check in? Uh, you know, what are you feeling? And then I think it's really important to identify what you're feeling before you check in. So you identify and then you can type what you check in. And then uh, all the guys in the community can comment, like, uh, we have an honor badge system where it's like if something really resonates with you, you can give a guy an honor badge for being really open, really vulnerable about it. Um, that's a really cool thing. Um, and then we have chats, right? So if you want to connect with some of the guys, you, you can say like, hey, man, I read your post. Uh, it really resonated with me. And you can take that offline and you can build a relationship that way. And we have other things that that you can do. We're, we're rolling out group programming that we started a pods based program where men uh, work in accountability pods to, towards things that are meaningful for them in their life. And we get them together, we get them sharing, we get them connecting, we get them in rooms with other like minded men, super important part of the process. Um, and then from there, uh, we give them a space where again, it's really just about because our brains forget we're like, our brains are really stupid, right? Like we forget that there's a, like, it's like you have a day where you're like, oh yeah, everybody feels like this, fuck, this other guy. And then the next day it's like, I'm a piece of shit. I'm the only one that feels like this. I'm a complete and other waste of a human being. Um, you know, I should probably just, you know, roll up my mat and, and go home, right? And then you go back on, you're like, oh yeah, wait, there's there's other people that, that we need to remind ourselves of that constantly. So <clears throat> I think it, it, it creates a safe space, which is super important. It gives men the ability to see other men modeling positive attitudes towards vulnerability, struggle, and sharing. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, I, I think it's a really great avenue towards service uptake for men. I mentioned at the beginning that men underutilize mental health and well-being services by like 50% compared to women. So like being able to see that other guys are just like raising their hand, being like, I went to therapy today and it was great. I went on medication today um, and I'm really hoping that this works. I went to counseling with my partner. I did this, I did that, right? Men, men admitting struggle and then also showing that they're taking action around that is like super, super, super powerful, right? Just as being like, okay, well, maybe I can do some therapy. Maybe I can okay, have that hard conversation with my partner. So really what we're trying to do is create an ecosystem where, um, uh, where, men can feel supported, right? So they've got that 24 seven support right in their back pocket. So they feel supported. They, they can actually take steps towards becoming the man that they wanna be. And we're giving them the tools that they can use daily to deepen, to learn, to check back in and to, and to really build that relationship with, with their emotions. So I think collectively that's what the platform is all about. And, um, you know, uh, I think, I think we've done a pretty good job of doing that and there, there's a lot more work to do for us. Uh, we're doing the best we can and, you know, I, you know, I hope we're around for the long run. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. And where can people like, just so I can attach some stuff for the blokes who are keen to get involved, where, where can, how do people get yeah. involved? So, uh, you can find us at www.tether.men. Uh, that's our website. Yep. Um, and Tether is spelled T-E-T-H-R. Um, and you can also download the app in both the Apple iOS store and the Google Play store. Um, so that's another place that you can find us. And then on all social medias, we're at Tether for Men. So at T-E-T-H-R-F-O-R-M-E-N. You can find us there. Yeah, pick it up. For everyone listening or watching or whatever you're choosing to do, all just check the show notes and you'll be able to click on that. Otherwise, you can do it the hard way and type it in yourself. 
But Maddie, mate, I know it's late. It's getting close to twelve thirty there for you. And if I was you, I would have been asleep about four hours ago. So I appreciate you jumping on. And this shit energizes me. I love it. So <laughs> don't don't worry. I'm probably gonna be up until three in the morning. Now. Just buzzing. Oh, mate, I mate, oh yeah, I'm gonna go on a run around the block. You've earned it. It's been that time where you've you've done the work, and now you deserve a nice walk around the block. Yes, sir. Well, mate, I appreciate all the work you're doing, and uh, everyone who's listening definitely head over and check out Tether for Men. Uh, and get involved because you're 100% right. It's not about just doing this shit when you feel like you're broken or you're at rock bottom. It's like it's it's prevention's better than cure. You go to the gym to look after your physical health. This is mental fitness. So practice the same stuff and you'll be good for the long run. Thank you so much for having me, man. It was really, it was a pleasure. Um, it was nice to see some sunlight in your background as, as well. It was kind of like, I was like, wait, is it, what, what's going on here? How, 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 did he, how did he do that? No, it was, it was a real pleasure to be on here with you, man. I really enjoyed the conversation. And, uh, um, you know, if there's anything I can ever do to help you or, or any way I can be of service, just, you know, you know where to find me now. Appreciate it, brother.